how's everybody doing today? How have you been enjoying the conference so far? Good. It's great. Yeah, it's been really wonderful. I'm really excited to see everyone's questions. Awesome. I am checking in right now for our Q&A. Um, I'm going to ask a question myself. I'm not even going to wait for anybody else to come in. Um, how do you both like working on the Apollo team? How have you enjoyed? You know, I know it's not the the largest team. I know everyone is really close. How do you guys feel ab about, you know, just the environment and, and kind of working on the tools that you do? I'll let Ben start because he's been there mm -hmm. the longest. Well, um, let me say it was definitely a trip to watch Scott earlier talk about uh, the application that they've built with Meteor and uh, apparently, um, you know, persistently kept up to date over many years uh, because as, as you may know, uh, this company got started as a JavaScript framework company. Uh, Meteor was our product and I worked on that full time along with everyone else at the company. Um, so things have changed since then. Uh, it does feel like a pivot to a totally different technology, uh, a, a different way of thinking about our role in the ecosystem um, in a lot of ways. But there are also a bunch of uh, through lines that I, I see uh, on the implementation side, especially, and in terms of what we're trying to do. So it's fun to sort of have gotten to uh, go along for that ride. Awesome. And I just joined uh, back in April, so I'm newer on the team. And for me, it's just a joy to work on open source for my day job. Um, I'm really happy to also join, uh, you know, a project that has so much impact and has already a really large community. So that that really matters to me. Yeah, I'll tell you, after being a part of GraphQL Summit and now Apollo Day, I I've just seen such an amazing gathering of community and and. Uh, you know, I can't imagine how good that must feel to work for the company that, you know, is, is able to curate and, and uh, you know, kind of feed all of the cool tools to such a great community. So we looked like we got our first question in. Um, what is the thing in Apollo Client 3 that you are the most excited about? Uh, I guess I'll go. Um, I wanted to, well, there's a whole bunch of sort of interlocking things, um, but one of the, the the points that I want to you know communicate at any opportunity that I have is that we've sort of created a new configuration API, and in some ways, the whatever you were doing before to achieve the same goal, whether it was using the connection directive or um, it, any number of sort of Apollo Client two uh, esque configuration APIs uh, in switching to Apollo client three, it, it may it may just feel like a, you know swapping one thing out for another, but something else is going on there, which is that you're, you're now able to define that logic in just like one place in your code. And that means that you like benefit every time you make an improvement to that, that one implementation of say a merge function for an important paginated field. And that's actually a, like a, a big step forward. Uh, even even though the migration may feel tedious, the the thing that you end up with is more centralized and more declarative. Um, so that's a a vague concept that uh, I'm excited about and hope to get other people excited about. Very cool. Yeah, I've really enjoyed that. I would say also I was really excited about reactive variables for local state management. It just makes a lot more sense. It's been really easy to use. Um, I've been using Apollo client in like little test applications and such uh, since I joined the team. And that's just been like really fun. The most fun part of open source, right, is getting to build it and then just run it into an app and, <laughs> and fingers crossed for the best there. Um, yeah. phew, these questions are pouring in. Awesome. Uh, I've never used GraphQL at all. When do I know when to add it to my project? And can I add it to a simple to-do app? Well, um, I, you know, uh, when you're when you're programming for the web uh, or any sort of client side development, even if that's like a, a mobile platform that's not JavaScript or the web, um, you've got this very important task at the beginning of everything, where you, you you just need all of the data that you're going to display, and you need to get it as quickly as possible. So, you know, the best way to do that is in um, 
a single request and uh, you can run into problems if that single request is fetching a lot more data than you actually need. Um, so GraphQL is great for, for that sort of, you know, page load time uh, mm -hmm. data loading, um, especially if you have problems with overfetching. Um, it's also great if what you actually have is a REST API behind all of that. You can stand up a GraphQL uh, server in front of that and um, not have to like, you know, swap out your entire stack uh, right away. So I would, I would say it's incrementally adoptable. Um, but yeah, uh, page load performance is, is an important part. Um, we're going a little bit further, I, I would say, with Apollo client in the sense that the client is actually taking those results, that data, turning it back into a graph, uh, so to speak, mm -hmm. on the client, and then fielding a whole bunch of different related questions based on the contents of that graph representation. Um, and we hope that that's going to unlock a lot of opportunity for you know reactive programming and uh, single page rich web applications and mobile applications. Uh, so it's not just about the page load uh, time, but I would say that's often, you know, one of the hooks that gets people into GraphQL. Awesome. Yeah, I think one of the uh, things for me that's always a, a great selling point and one of the things that I always tried to push when I was uh, trying to bring it into the workplace was how easy it was to understand the data that you're working with, right? Like with a REST endpoint, you have to, you know, bog through a bunch of the data that you're getting back and then construct the the kind of idea that, of, okay, I'm going to take this data and put it in the UI. With GraphQL, you know, you can even speak to non-technical folks and, and be like, hey, look, you know, bring it to your design and be like, hey, look, these are the, these are the data points in which I'm going to be bringing in, you know, how do we structure the UI around this? And it just is a very easily readable kind of structure to share around your team and to share with non-technical folks. And I think that for me is, has always been a huge selling point of GraphQL. Yeah, couldn't agree awesome. more. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Jen, I know you've been doing a lot of work on the AC dev tools. Uh, what has it been like to take on that project and what excites you about those dev tools the most? Yeah, so it's what I've been working on most of the time that I've been on the team. And part of that has been learning how to build dev tools, which is a whole new you know, space for me and has been a lot of fun, but also a bit headachey. There's a lot of hoops that you have to jump through to get things working. And one of the things I wanted to look at when we started to think about what we wanted to do with the dev tools was how do we make it so that one, we can expand on the dev tools more easily in the future and give y'all better uh, access to tools that you want and need. Uh, and then two, how do I make it so that people in the community can come contribute more easily to the dev tools? Um, because just by nature of like having to deal with the browser and the browser APIs, it can really be a struggle to understand what's going on. So that's been a large part of my focus and they're coming along great. We are you know, hoping to have an early uh, release for people to check out, uh, hopefully sometime in December. Um, and I would love right. to have more people like come and help me out on the project. Awesome. And this is totally out of left field. This isn't a question. Um, what do you, you know, what would you say to those who are looking to contribute? You know, what are the, you know, I, I feel like, especially for me who just started as a maintainer myself of open source, it's so hard to figure out the best ways to onboard and, and things like that. You know, what would you say to somebody who may be new to open source that, you know, looks at Apollo client and, and, and they get a little bit intimidated by the breadth of, of you know, what dev tools can be? Yeah, it's definitely, uh, it can be overwhelming to look at a new code base. I would say if you're really interested in contributing to a project, one of the first things you can do is just take down the code base yourself, uh, clone it, look through it, get used to it, which is, by the way, a skill that's going to help you for the rest of your life as an engineer. Um, definitely. It's a very big thing to come into a code base and be able to figure out how it works pretty quickly. And to be honest, also figuring out the rough patches. Um, I've been working on this project for a while now. Um, so when people come on board to help me, I'm going to be very interested to hear like, what, what could I make better about the developer experience for you to get started? How can I make it easier for other people to then come on board? That's awesome. Um, we're going to just run right into another question for you, Jen. Uh, how is the DevTools refactoring coming along? It's coming along great. 
uh, like I mentioned, we are hoping to have uh, an early release for y'all to play around with in December, uh, and then a more formal release uh, next year early, because it's going to take some time to work out some bugs. Um, sure. One of the really difficult things about building dev tools is you don't know all the types of applications it's going to be used on and mm -hmm. what kind of errors could crop up. So it works really well in my test applications. I just used it on Apollo Studio. The other day, it's working really well. but who knows <laughs> if someone else has a different configuration, uh, I'll, I'll need to adjust it, but it's as long as it works on your machine, you know, <laughs> no, <laughs> um, we do cool, still awesome, have really. an older version of dev tools, uh, that, that works as most more or less as well as it ever did. Uh, so if, if you download that and try it out, it can be useful, uh, but it's not what Jen is working on. Uh, yeah. It's a great way to see the cache and see some of your queries mutations, but it, it, need some some love from an engineer so that's what i'm doing well, now. i'm i'm sure it's getting that love right now cool um for ben uh are there some good practices for doing persistence with apollo client 3. uh sure it's a great question uh so my my tldr recommendation is that there was and is a package um well it used to be called apollo dash cache dash persist uh, on NPM. Um, and the, the main tip here is that in updating it to Apollo Client 3, they decided to change the, the package name to Apollo 3-cache-persist. So, you know, uh, you, you may have been able to get the old package to continue working if you had been using it, but um, the, the work that they've done to make it work with Apollo Client 3 is under the new package name. Um, so that is, uh, it's under our GitHub, but it is also a community driven uh, project and the, the people who are maintaining it, um, we we're in contact with them. We have let them know that, you know, ultimately probably before Apollo client four, that is along the, the three point, whatever minor release line, we want to bring uh, persistence at, into the core of Apollo client as, as an Apollo client sort of general feature. Um, and the, the appeal of that is that, uh, we would be able to, you know, let, let you provide some sort of plugin that um, abstracts away the, the specific device storage API that you might be using, depending on whether you're in a web browser or you're in React Native or or what have you. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, once you provide us with that, we can sort of uh, do everything else um, in in a in a general way. Uh, for example. Uh, if you have been using reactive variables uh, with Apollo Client 3, uh, so far you may have noticed that they are just a, an in-memory uh, figment of the, the cache's imagination. They don't get persisted along with the rest of the cache data if you had set something like that up. So we would want to you know, make sure that we hooked up reactive variables into that persistence system in the same way so that you know, by the time you start doing any GraphQL stuff, anything that you know, could have been loaded from persistent storage will have been loaded. Um, so in the meantime, Apollo 3-cache-persist is uh, the place to go. And uh, you know, most, most people who are doing persistence with Apollo Client, I think, are using that package. So we will for sure have a, have a good um, you know, migration path from, from using that when the time comes. Awesome. Um, we're just going to jump into another question for you, Ben. Uh, are there any plans to improve the mock provider for testing in the near future? Um, let's see, I, I feel the need to be honest that that work is not, um, specifically scheduled, but, but also that, uh, almost nothing that we've done in the, the major new version three, uh, involved any improvements to those APIs. So they, they are a little bit out in the cold, uh, unloved, um, and desperately in need of not just a, a revamp, but a, a rewrite. Um, I would. I don't know. I, I could I could go into a laundry list of uh, things that I don't like about mock provider and mock link. Um, one saving grace, I suppose, is that they are both uh, sort of built around the concept of an Apollo link, um, which is our, our network abstraction. So you know, if if you really wanted to you know dig in and like build uh, a library or a tool yourself, you're not stuck with mock provider, mock link. Um, you can do it sort of in terms of the lower level Apollo link API, which is something we um, don't have any intentions of, of changing because it's not because it's uh, 
you know, been neglected, but because it works really well and has been a, a great abstraction for us to treat as a black box from the perspective of Apollo client. So Apollo link can solve some of those use cases, but, you know, for the same reasons that people want to use uh, mock provider um, in the first place, we owe it to them to uh, make those, those tools work better. Awesome. And yeah, I'm sure the community appreciates the transparency. It's definitely one of the things that I feel like is, is really hard is to, uh, you know, have all of these things lined up and know that there's something that that needs to get touched, but just isn't, you know, at that point yet of of, of hitting, you know, production. So I uh, appreciate, as always, the transparency. Um, Jen, as a big user of Apollo client dev tools, uh, I'm very excited for the refactor. Will there be any additional functionality to the new version as well? When we do the release, there will be new UI and there, it's definitely going to be just a better experience overall. But the new functionality is going to come probably a little bit later. What we want to do right now is just release it with parity with the older version, but make it a completely new code base. It's being completely refactored so that we can build new features on top of it much more easily and much quicker. So if you have ideas about you know things that you want, I want to hear that. Definitely, like you can go to the repo, you can open up an issue and say it's a, a feature that you'd like. And I have a whole list of things that in the future I'd like to put in the dev tools. We're getting a lot of feedback from our internal teams as well. Uh, so new features will be coming, but right when it's released uh, next year, it'll probably be similar functionality. Awesome. Yeah, I'm sure everyone's excited to see that new UI for sure. Um, oh, it, it looks really nice and it's very purple right now, but we'll see. I, was, I like purple. Purple is definitely one of those colors that like, I feel like every time I, I get onto something and there's not a dark mode with like some type of purple tint, I'm immediately <laughs> depressed. So I'm excited to see that myself. Um, ben, uh, what is the upgrade path to Apollo 3 to replace async local resolvers? It is possible to use reactive variables to achieve a similar effect. And is the experience much different? Um, wow. Uh, what a great question. Um, so we, we, we had a lot of uh, decisions to make about um, which APIs we were going to try to improve and whether we thought the improvement um, was you know, so complete that we could just go ahead and get rid of the, the old API. We did that with things like cache redirects and um, the heuristic fragment matcher, the whole fragment matcher. API um, because we thought in that example that the possible types configuration, you know, provided literally everything you, you needed. Um, but one of the one of the steps we might have liked to have taken, uh, but decided not to, was um, that we we decided not to remove the the local state abstraction in Apollo Client three. And you know, I, I think when I gave a talk at Summit, our GraphQL Summit uh, two years ago, I may have made it seem like we, we were planning to deprecate that API. And it still would be great if we felt like all of the use cases that it serves are met by Apollo Client 3. But this is one of the, um, I, I don't want to call it an edge case because it's an important one, um, the ability to return a promise from a local state resolver function um, was pretty useful, uh, at, at least in terms of the sort of uh, you know, logical behavior of the code. In some other ways, it's it's not that great because um, if you're, you know, generating a promise for uh, a single field within a single object, uh, you might think, okay, that's not too expensive. But if suddenly uh, you're doing that for um, a whole list of objects that that have that field, um, there are just a couple of more dimensions that can explode. You know. Combinatorially and having having the, the asynchronous um, pauses like in the middle of the critical path of reading from the cache um, has has caused some performance problems in in the past. So uh, very briefly, the uh, it is it is true as the question suggested that you can sort of approximate uh, the behavior of an async local resolver with um, a field policy read function that uses a reactive variable. And the goal there is just to you know, do the thing that returns the promise. And uh, when you get a result back from the promise, set that as the value of the reactive variable. And then you know, everything will recompute. Um, 
it's a little boilerplatey, and I it's uh, you know my goal in almost everything is to put nice easy to use abstractions around things. And it's so tempting to abstract away that pattern, but there are some important like opinionated application level questions that you have to answer. So, um, you know, right now uh, what we're looking for is a good way to tell that story so that you don't have to think about it any deeper than you, you really need to, but that you, you do sort of understand what's going on uh, behind the scenes, uh, especially if you're translating from an older, uh, local state resolver function to a read function. Um, however, I, I think there's a bunch of fun things that we can do to streamline that story and maybe even make it uh, more of a black box. So excited to get to that in the upcoming minor versions. Yeah, it's, it's always hard to like not want to sprinkle some more syntactic sugar on a process to make it just a little bit easier, but then you fall into a trap of what is that going to do for the, you know, the apps that already use it and what does that upgrade path look like? Um, yep. so Jen, uh, will the new version of dev tools work out of the box or will there need to be some kind of configuration and setup required in your code? So just like the current, uh, dev tools, they'll work out of the box. So it'll be a Chrome or Firefox extension. You'll just need to add it and it should work in development mode out of the box for production. Awesome. You probably do need a little bit of adjustments, but that's currently the case as well. So none of that is going to be changing. It's just that the current dev tools, we're a really small team. We are spread out across projects. And, you know, I joined in April and dev tools has been my focus since I would say about July. Um, so we're just like finally being able to like actually put someone on that project and really make it good for y'all. Um, it was languishing because we're a small team. So now it's getting love. So it'll be very similar in, in regards to how it worked previously with it being an extension, being out of the box and, and very little setup. Very cool. And I, I know you're excited to, to put that out after getting onto the team and having some time to focus on it. So I'm excited to see that. Uh, ben, dealing with pagination and cache is never easy. Uh, I've heard of pagination helpers. Can you explain what those are? Sure. So, uh, you, you you may have heard you know little fragments of of discussion in in talks or uh, you know in a, in a setting like this about field policies type policies. If you watched Laura's talk just before this, then uh, you got a lot of information about that. Um, that may feel like sort of a a low level like power user API, and if you feel that way, you're you're not wrong. Uh, it's it's our take on everything we thought you would need to implement uh, fairly complicated patterns like pagination. And I guess it's worth remembering that within GraphQL, pagination is, is not a first class concept. It's just something that you can do. And a lot of GraphQL servers do it uh, using you know, fields and field arguments and, and lists, right? Um, and so instead of, um, you know, standardizing on, on one way of, of thinking of pagination. We sort of give you the building blocks to uh, put together to uh, work with any, any kind of paginated fields that, that you need to work with, um, whether it's you know, very simple like concatenation or um, more complicated offset limit pagination or cursor-based. Uh, I should also mention that we finally, finally uh, got around to publishing some new documentation. There's a whole section just about pagination under the um, Apollo Client Web React section of our docs. So please, please go read that. Uh, it was felt really you know, important to get that out there. But pagination helpers specifically are some, uh, they, they, they live in a, at Apollo slash client slash utilities. That's where you would import them from. And they're just functions that return a field policy with like key args and uh, maybe a read function and a merge function. Um, and if you happen to be using a kind of pagination that uh, fits one of the use cases that um, we're supporting as, as a first step, then you may be able to get away with just uh, calling one of those functions and assigning that as the field policy for your field. So you, you, you don't have to write the merge function. But I would say it is important to like at least look through that code and see what exactly it's doing, because there's a lot of dimensions of uh, ways that you could write a field policy. And if you need to, you are absolutely welcome to just copy and paste that code and tweak it 
you know, to do what you need it to do for your specific use case. So I don't want people to think like if there's a little bit of a mismatch between what those helpers do and what they need that like that's a bug. Um, you know, there are more examples uh, of how you could write increasingly complicated field policies than, you know, the only ones that you can possibly use. Okay. Yeah, I think you had me immediately at copy and paste. That's about half of my life at this point. So, <laughs> yep. Um, thank you. Cool. Uh, so let's see here. They are pouring in. Um, Jen, you mentioned no new features at release, uh, but is there anything that you would like to see added? Well, there will be some new things. They're just they're smaller features. Um, for instance, there's going to be a light mode and a dark mode. Definitely. I'm getting that for y'all. I know you like your dark modes. Um, and we are also adding in the ability to uh, currently with the dev tools, while you can see the query string and you can see the variables, you can't see what the actual cache result was. We're going to show that to you um, as well as uh, the ability to uh, copy and paste like query strings, variables, and that cache data. So that's all going to be a nicer experience. And those are, are smaller new features. Uh, some of the stuff that I'm more excited about giving you in the future is more information about the cache that has to do with type policies, fetch policies, uh, information that you would need to know without having to go look into your code and see what's going on. I want to start to surface those in the dev tool so that you can actually see what's happening. Um, beyond that, I'm just really excited to build a code base that's going to be easier to work with. Uh, so that whatever wonderful features y'all want to request, I'm going to be able to actually get them built for you or help like work with you to get them built. And that is really exciting to me too. Definitely. Cool. Very cool. Uh, ben, do you recommend using Apollo cache for local state as well as network data? So, Yes. Uh, I should get right to my my answer uh, to the question, which is definitely yes. Um, but a nuance that I, I, I try to put out into the world every time I talk about this is that there's not just one kind of client-side local state. Um, there was a good talk by Jed Watson at a, a GraphQL summit a couple of years ago about, I think his title was a treatise on local state. And the thesis was there's like at least five different kinds of meaningfully different you know, local state that you might need to deal with in a, a rich client-side web application or mobile application. And um, it is totally fine to use uh, different tools for different jobs. Like if, if you're using React and you need some component specific local state, like specific to the instance of the component, not just to the like the, the function or the class, then um, there's for sure nothing wrong with using uh, you know use state or uh, use ref um, the the react tools that you're you're given right so I would say that um, Apollo client is hoping to uh, fit into the category of more global client side state um, so you know things like whether the user is logged in um, uh, if if there's like a shopping cart, you know, for the app, there's probably only one of those and it's somewhat global. Um, it's not like specific to a component that might be duplicated on the page, right? Um, those kinds of local state are a great fit for Apollo Client. Um, and since Apollo Client 2, when we were asking you to sort of, I don't know, force your, your thinking about local state into GraphQL terms, you know, queries and mutations, I think we've improved that story quite a bit, um, specifically by uh, offering an alternative to the, the mutation side of things with reactive variables. So you just, you call a function to update the, the value of the reactive variable instead of sort of contriving uh, a, a mutation to interact with, with the cache. Um, I don't know, GraphQL has a lot of conceptual benefits and ergonomic benefits, but that's one area where the ergonomic benefits of GraphQL just really weren't paying off. So. Um, you know, we are looking for ways to make that uh, go go more smoothly uh, and and feel lighter weight. Awesome. Uh, I want to yeah. add on to that too because before I joined this team, I was a, a front end architect, and so I actually dealt with this question of like, where does local state go constantly and. It is really important, like Ben said, to remember that React gives you tools for local state and maybe you don't want to use the local state management of a larger library. 
and how I think about this, and it might be helpful for other people, is that I usually think about ownership of that state and who is allowed to give the ownership for it changes to be made to it. So like passing down the ability to have an uh, on a handler do on um, do set state. Um, and also thinking about who needs the data and how many pieces and where they are in the system. Um, so that will start to help you narrow down where that should live. Yeah, I think often like, you know, especially with third party libraries and even React context itself, people uh, often find themselves just pushing uh, a lot of state up into a context store and then having this kind of waterfall of context around their app where it's really hard to figure out what state is happening where, you know, children to, to grandchildren. Uh, and I think one of those things is definitely fixable by just kind of pushing your state for something as close as you can to its source of truth and and then hope that, you know, and then having something like Apollo 2 handle things like, you know, auth and, and making sure that we're, you know, showing the right pages. I think that's such an important part of especially the React ecosystem is that it, it can get fuzzy about the decision that you want to make. But uh, a lot of the time, the internal tools will definitely do a lot of the, the heavy lifting for you. Yeah, and cool. you know, any anything that we can put into Apollo client to help with local state can be represented somehow in dev tools, right? Like imagine being able to see the contents of all your reactive variables there. Um, yeah. So you know, just lots of opportunities. That's where Apollo always shines. The ecosystem, you know, folds into itself, and there's so many things that interweave that you know you you really get brought into uh, a very fruitful ecosystem as far as your tooling is concerned. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, ben, um, what is it like working on such a large project that is used so widely? Oh, it's pretty nerve wracking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not it's not the most uh, widely used project that I'm responsible for, but but in terms of like how often I change it and create risk for you know things going poorly, it's definitely the the biggest sort of uh, psychic you know cloud hanging over me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Is that an adequate answer? Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's scary. Exciting. <laughs> it's I, as scary as everybody thinks it will be. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to save people time, right? Like, I'm not a doctor. I'm not saving people's lives. I'm not an entertainer. I'm not like improving the quality of their lives. But like, if we can save you time building an application that matters to you, then um, you know that that is the end goal. And as long as there's, you know, continual evidence of that happening, then can definitely deal with the, uh, the stress of it being as widely used as it is. Um, but, you know, we have a long way to go before we are in every React app. So, uh, you know, it's just going to get more stressful from here. Yeah, and in the end of the day, you, you may not be the one directly saving people's lives and or making those differences, but empowering those who may be building software to uh, empower those things and save people's lives. Uh, I think that's one of the things that you do contribute to. So I appreciate, uh, you know, the Apollo team and the work that you're doing specifically. It's it's definitely something that I feel makes uh, building these large scale applications so much less scary. So, um, you know, kudos to, to you for that. Uh, let's see here for Jen. Uh, is Apollo client dev tools for Firefox and Chrome two different code bases? If so, how hard is it to develop for both platforms? So it's not, it's it's one code base for both browsers. Um, the the code actually developing it with the browser APIs is not is not the difficult part. The the difficult part is actually the testing in both browsers because there's no automate like automated way of doing this. Uh, mm -hmm. Firefox provides some really great tools that are very helpful for this. Uh, but ultimately, like at the end of the day, I'm taking a zip file and I'm uploading it to the different extension stores. <laughs> so it's a very manual process. Yeah. Big ups to you on that because I know that. <laughs> gets, I, I worked with uh, an extension at one of my previous jobs and trying to do testing was like an absolute nightmare. Yeah, it's really, really difficult. <laughs> um, ben, uh, what are the things coming down the pipeline next and why? Um, okay, so there's a couple of different timescales here. There is uh, in, the, in the most immediate... Uh, time scale, we are wrapping up work on Apollo client 3.3. Um, if you npm install at Apollo slash client at beta, uh, you can get the latest version of that. And you know, to the extent that getting that out there is a blocker for everything else that we're going to do in the future, it would really help. You know, if people would just 
try updating your, your applications. Uh, if you're, especially if you're already using 3.2, uh, then 3.3, you know, should not be a big leap, but it's, you know, a hundred or so commits. So it's not, um, a tiny release. Um, one of the things that I'm excited about in, in that release, uh, I'm not going to do justice to the the change log, um, but we've we've made it possible for uh, type policies to inherit from each other based on the uh, supertype subtype relationships in your in your possible types information. So you can put a configuration for a field, say in in a single shared supertype, and then it'll just automatically apply to all of the concrete uh, types that extend from that, like interfaces from your schema or members of a, a union type. So that's pretty cool. Um, we talked a little bit about, uh, I guess, looking looking beyond 3.3 to 3.4. Uh, we talked a little bit about persistence earlier. I, I think that you know might be the first opportunity that we have to sort of bring that into the core and see what what that experience could be like. Um, another opportunity that I see just kind of lying on the table is that anyone who has implemented federation according to our Federation spec um, will have had to set up a system where you can request any object by its type name and ID fields uh, using the root underscore queries field. And um, I don't want to overstate this. I think in most Federation setups, that's actually not publicly exposed, but at least the functionality is there. And if Apollo client had access to that uh, underscore entities field, um, then instead of resending the whole query, whenever there's any missing data in it, we could formulate a query that would ask for just the objects whose fields were missing and potentially request a lot less data, update objects that are in a list in place, um, that sort of thing. And it could be something that you opted into on like a type by type basis through the, the type policies system. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I think somehow a lot of people have the idea in their mind that that must be what Apollo client is already doing. So I kind of want to catch up to that expectation and actually do it. Um, I think Apollo Client 4 will mostly be about uh, taking stock of the APIs that we hoped that we could deprecate and replace and, you know, removing them if, if we feel like we're at that point, but we're not going to do that until um, I don't know, we, we feel like we've actually replaced the use cases that uh, we would be removing. So, um, yeah, I, I've got a, you know, long uh, list of, of features that I, I could talk about here. Um, I don't know. I've, I've never felt great about refetch queries, and I think I can see a way where your mutation could just sort of figure out which queries are affected by the update, and uh, you you could automatically uh, just refetch those queries without having to enumerate them. Um, but that's a bit of more of a uh, a stretch goal, maybe three point five. Um, yeah, those are those are some of the things that are coming down the pipe, and and why? Um, well, it just you know seems like uh, an essential part of uh, fully featured GraphQL client. Uh, so, you know, we want that part of your uh, tool chain, you know, even though it's already providing value, we hope right now to just sort of accumulate more and more value and make you sort of happier that you adopted this technology going forward, even without having to, you know, put in a lot of effort to um, take advantage of those those new features. So I, that may go without saying, but uh, yeah, we, we are, we're trying to be a fully featured GraphQL um, library, not necessarily, uh, you know, the barest bones implementation of, of what that could look like, because, you know, you, you can use fetch uh, perfectly well as a GraphQL client. There's a whole spectrum of places that you might end up in terms of, uh, you know, how you consume GraphQL in your clients. Yeah, I think that uh, that refetch queries ideas sounds really cool, especially um, cool. working with that. I feel like, you know, this kind of like being able to auto fetch fragments of what was updated and and kind of pull out through the type name like what what type of updates were made and, and changes were made that sounds like a a really interesting thing and i'm i'm excited to see the further development of um apollo client 3 for sure <clears throat> um jen uh are there any plans to target any other browsers in the future for the dev tools um mm -hmm. Right now, no, we're just gonna stick with Firefox and Chrome at the moment. We do wanna make sure that it works really well if you wanna debug React Native because we know that's important. Um, but as far as other browsers, no right now. Cool. And then uh, also, um, how do you test Apollo Client DevTools? 
Uh, okay. Mostly manually. Um, so there's no end-to-end -end testing available for uh, DevTools extensions or extensions really of any type. It's it, like pretty much impossible to do. Uh, I did a, a big research <laughs> sprint on this topic uh, before I started on it because it was going to help us a lot if we could figure out how to do it. And unfortunately, not possible. Um, so so most of the time I am manually testing things. Please be kind to your local DevTools developer. Um, <laughs> we're doing a lot of things manually. Other than that, I do rely on unit tests and integration tests. The older code base for the uh, 2.0 plus version of DevTools didn't have any tests in it. Uh, no unit tests, no integration tests. And so as we build out this new code base, that is really important to us, as well as we're now using TypeScript to help with type safety. Um, so all those things that we're trying to do to, to make it just a safer code base to work in, especially considering that we don't have end-to-end -end testing to help us catch things. Yeah, I'm sure it's also hard to kind of like refactor it to a new code base and not have any kind of backlog of, of kind of ideas of the tests that that you know would be important to recreate um so yeah, yeah like like she said be nice be nice to your you know your your dev tools creators they're they're going through it um all right all right ben uh what are what are apollo clients plans for react suspense and data fetching so uh i can i can be very specific um i think that uh we we don't have it right now. Um, it hasn't been a huge priority uh, for a while. The the story was that it was still stabilizing, and I don't know. Maybe there's some value in postponing an implementation until you're building against a more stable API. Um, but you know, at some point, we may need to make a call about uh, whether it's stable enough, and how many other people have started using it such that it uh, is sort of uh, necessarily stable, even if the React team wants to change it. Um, but what that would look like concretely is that the say the use query hook would take an option along with like you know fetch policy or variables um, called something like suspense or suspend and it would just be a boolean and if you said suspend true then what that would allow use query to do instead of returning sort of a, a useless initial loading result is to you know do do the suspensey things of uh, throwing a promise and um, having the, the component re-render um, once that promise has, has resolved. Um, so I think the API from our side is, is probably you know, something that we could, we could stabilize even in the absence of a totally stable React API, which probably means we should go ahead and do it. Um, if our manager, Hugh Wilson, uh, was on this call, he could, he could talk uh, a lot more about that. I think it, it is something that we, we will do. It, it is a, a roadmap item, so. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so, Jen, uh, it's awesome to see a renewed focus for the browser dev tools. Has the Apollo client team been thinking about other dev tools that could be useful within the Apollo client ecosystem? Yes, I would say that we do. We do have these discussions from time to time. You know, we have thoughts on what we could do, but I would also say that we're a really small team. And so, our focus is, our focus really, we just keep bringing ourselves back to like our two things right now, which is making AC3 the best it can possibly be and getting you dev tools that are really, really good in the browser and are really gonna help you out and building out that functionality. We're such a small team, we just can't do everything that we wanna do. Um, ben comes up with a lot of ideas. He's like, this would be really cool, but we have to wait. <laughs> We're like, but Ben. <laughs> Build it now. Um, he's one person. <laughs> I'm one person. Uh, we're a small team, so we just can't get everything done that we want to. That kind of leads me, um, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I think that that leads me into a next good question that will help with kind of that that small team aspect is, um, are there any tips or recommendations beyond, you know, just checking out the code base on a way to get up to speed with the Apollo client code base as a new contributor? I would say that not not um, specific to Apollo Client's uh, code base is the fact that if you want to contribute to open source, you will need to reckon with the fact that you may not get a response very quickly. Mm -hmm. And maybe by not very quickly, I mean like weeks, months. Um, 
it's not like your normal uh, engineering day job where you have someone look at a PR uh, the day that you make it or maybe the second day. Um, it, we're stretched pretty thin, so we, we don't see everything all the time. Um, the other thing I would say is Ben is really, really good about writing really wonderful descriptions for his PRs and changes. And there is a wealth of information in those. So if you're really curious about how something works or why something is the way it is, go look through issues and pull requests from Ben and you will find a ton of information that will help you out. Cool. And I, and I think another thing in, in this scenario is, you know, getting involved with your community. Uh, it doesn't always have to be the, the main contributors or the project owners that can help you get up to speed. You know, if there's one thing that I've realized, and I talked about it a bit earlier, is that this community, especially surrounding Apollo, but a GraphQL community as a whole, super helpful, always has resources on deck. Uh, get involved in those communities and, you know, ask around, poke around, get yourself involved with the conversations. I think that's one of the big kind of barriers when it comes to open sources. There's the the entirety of thinking, okay, this code base is not something I know. But then there's also the thing of like, you know, all of the conversations going on around it can feel extremely overwhelming to get involved with. But poking your head in and 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 being involved and asking questions is, is, is the best way to start figuring out how contribution works for you. So um, definitely recommend that with, with, you know, the, the dev tools and the team behind it and the people that are contributing, just getting involved with that community itself. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, ben, here's a good one. Are there any plans to support Flutter? Um, that's not on our roadmap now, but uh, to the point of, you know, getting involved, uh, I would say the best way to kickstart that conversation, um, we do have sort of a centralized uh, feature request repository under the Apollo GraphQL GitHub organization. Um, and it, it can feel like that sort of separate and uh, that we don't pay enough attention to it. That's, that's true. Um, but the reason that it's separate is because um, a lot of features are sort of like, you know, uh, groups of features that span more than just the client or more than just the, the server. So, you know, there needs to be a place to talk about those, those project spanning features. Um, so yeah, uh, if you open an issue there and um, lay out what that would look like, uh, what the benefits would be, I think the, the biggest question to answer with, with any integration is just like, you know, to what extent should this be another uh, opportunity to use some sort of generic plugin system that we provide? And to what extent should it be like a, a first class thing where you like, you know, see the word flutter in the Apollo client code base. Um, but I should, I should just disclaim that I'm not super familiar with what uh, flutter is even as a category of thing. So uh, if, if what I'm saying is somehow logically inconsistent with what uh, you understand, that to mean, then uh, yeah, uh, feel free to educate me, uh, us, the team, in um, in an issue in the the future requests repository. Cool. Um, and then um, yeah, so Ben, again, since Apollo has both client and server projects, has there been any thought around the ways that those two projects could be more closely integrated? Well, um, coupling them together uh, is not a goal. Um, we definitely want Apollo client to be a GraphQL client that you can use with any public or private GraphQL API. Um, and Apollo server, um, you know, you, you may be in a situation where you, you don't want to use Apollo client on, on your client because, you know, there's something a lot simpler that you feel like you can get away with. You don't need a, a normalized cache. You don't need reactivity um, or, you know, any of the things that we've been talking about today. That's fine. Um, so the last thing we would ever want to do is, you know, build like a, a feature that we were, you know, really marketing that uh, sort of assumed that you, you were locked into both a Apollo client and a server at the same time, in part because, you know, the servers that you're using when you're using GraphQL are often not yours, right? Like you, you just don't, right. you don't get to make the decision about how they're implemented. So. We, we feel like it ties our hands if we sort of indulge in that, you know, otherwise very appealing uh, prospect. Um, but I don't know, as, as an example of a feature that we considered sort of building in a, you know, opt-in way where you could take advantage of it if you happen to be using both 
a Apollo client and Apollo server, um, or some other server where you implemented that part of it, you know, yourself. Um, uh, right now, uh, when you configure your in-memory cache, you have to tell it about all of the super types and subtypes in your schema, the possible types. And uh, when you do that, uh, you probably do it at build time. You're sort of taking a snapshot of your schema uh, at, at that moment in time. But you can have clients that uh, you know stick around for for weeks. Uh, and you can easily re release a new version of your, your server with a, a different schema with different uh, subtypes um, that are unknown to those clients that happen to still be open in somebody's browser. Um, so we thought it would be like a really seamless experience if the server could, with each query in the extensions section of the response, send back any like new possible types information that um, might be useful for interpreting the fragments in in that query, um, and I, I still think like you you could do that um, that that is possible, um, and it, I would love to hear about it if anyone wants to give it a try. We ended up going in a slightly different direction that was just focused on the client, where it's once again possible to do some sort of fuzzy or heuristic matching of possible types, um, and that was implemented in Apollo Client three point two. Um, so check that out if that feels like a use case that that you might have. But that that's a case where we you know briefly considered going down the route of coupling the server and the client together, and then backed away from it as we usually do. Yeah, I think that was going to be like one of my my questions after was like you know the the mundane kind of retyping of all of your data objects between server and and client always felt uh, like. And I know there's like code gen now, and there's ways to kind of type at one time and then, you know, generate new code, new, new, new types for, you know, whether it be TypeScript or, or I'm sure the client, but that was definitely one of the things that I felt was uh, something that I wanted to, because I was building a lot of at the time, um, kind of servers that would sit in front of GraphQL or uh, REST APIs. So I was consistently trying to figure out like what were the type objects and then kind of feeding those into the client. So I think that's a really interesting kind of piece of the ecosystem. Um, we got a couple of more questions here. Uh, one is going to be, uh, is the Apollo team hiring? Yes. Are we, are we allowed to say? <laughs> yes, we will be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> specifically, we're, we're trying, and this is a big lift, uh, to get out of the equilibrium of having one senior engineer working on each of our different client projects. So there's DevTools, there's Apollo Client Web, there's Apollo Client uh, Android Kotlin and Apollo Client iOS Swift. And each of those projects has one person on it right now who's sort of like singly responsible for um, you know, progress uh, on that project and uh, you know, doubling the total size of the team by putting one more person on each of those projects would be amazing, but that's another um, three or four people that we would need to hire, so. Yeah, that's a that's a big priority for for hiring in the in the next year. Yeah, I guess a, a follow up question that to that would be like, you know, what are the types of things um, that would, you know, really help somebody prepare for the types of roles that the Apollo client team might be looking for in the near future? Like, you know, I know for me, I, I would always go and say when there's an open source project, being involved in that open source project, having commits in that open source project is always a key move. Uh, but is there anything else, any advice from the two of you for ways to ramp up to, to get towards kind of being a, you know, a, a desirable candidate in that way? Yeah. So contributing to open source is uh, helpful, but not a deal breaker because contributing to open source also requires you to have a certain type of life where you have amount of time to do that. Um, and not everyone does. So if we can, if we limited ourselves to that, we would also be limiting our, our uh, candidate pool. So we're not gonna do that. Also, uh, just while I have contributed to open source projects in the past, um, I was hired for this team mostly off of my front end architect experience. Uh, and I would say that's really valuable, um, which is that I worked with many different React code bases that were architected in many different ways. I learned a lot of lessons from those. And then I started to architect my own code base at one of uh, my jobs. Um, and that is 
really important, the ability to know the trade-offs of a technical decision um, and also what that developer experience of a technical decision is gonna be like, those are, those are really important for the work that we do. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much. I, I feel like, you know, we hit you with millions of questions that were all answered. Absolutely perfect. Um, if anybody has any more questions or a question that they put up and they didn't see answered, um, I'm sure the team would be happy to field those questions over in the Discord. The Q&A channel is still open. Uh, ben and Jen, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure getting to talk to y'all and meet y'all uh, through the internet. Hopefully one day soon we will we will get to meet in person when things are back to normal. But again, thank y'all so much. You bet. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.